Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to Template Driven App Development Scheduling in a Snap presented by DevExpress Technical Evangelist Seth Juarez. In this webinar, Seth will demonstrate our Outlook inspired application template and D Experience 12.1 released as part of our next generation of developer tools, DX2. Get your projects up and running faster with our series of templates that deliver a visually appealing starter app that can be expanded into a full app to meet your business needs. Seth will answer questions at the end of the session, but you can enter your questions at any time in the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Now, before we get started, DevExpress would love to know a little bit more about all of you joining us today. So we do have a couple poll questions for you. The first one here is, are you currently purchasing third-party tools for your development needs? And you can select one or more of the following easy responses, yes or no. I'll just give everybody a quick second to get your answers in. Uh, we look like we're at about 75% yes, 70% yes, and 25% no. All right. Great. And then our next poll question is, if you are currently using Dev, uh, uh, third party controls, are you a DevExpress customer? And again, select one or more of the following, yes or no. Awesome. So about 60% are, um, are DevExpress customers. Great. Thanks for joining us. All right, everybody, so thank you for your valuable feedback, and again, thank you for joining us here. I will now hand things over to Seth Juarez. Good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Juarez, and you will never guess where I am today, Amanda. She, she muted herself, didn't she? You know, Amanda, where are does not, you? <laughs> Amanda does not listen to my webinars. It's like a 30-minute break for her, everybody. I just want to throw that out there. But the content will be exciting and lovely. I am in... Uh, near Moscow. I am traveling abroad today, and so Amanda is in Washington, and so we are excited to come to you today to talk about template-driven app development. Let me show you a little bit about what it is we're going to talk about. So uh, this is what we're going to we're going to go over today. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to talk about templates in general. I'm going to show you a couple of them, and then I am going to use the Outlook starter template sample to build a fully functioning application that you can actually use, one that, that's going to be useful for you, and we're going to do it pretty quickly. I'm estimating somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes of content interspersed with uh, questions. I, I take Sometimes I take questions during, uh, sometimes uh, after, and so if you have a question that you feel is very pressing, tell Amanda and she will stop and, and talk to me about it. Okay, so one of the scariest things that I have ever been faced with as a writer, for example, because we do a lot of writing, is this empty page. Uh, you, you guys have all seen this, where you have this daunting task of building X, and you don't know how to get there. You know what it's supposed to look like, but you're, you have a hard feeling. That is the same kind of feeling I get when I start a blank project. You see this empty form. You know you have a lot of requirements and business rules. You know the form and style of the application that you want to build. And you also understand that you have to get it done quickly. DevExpress has been in the business of helping developers get started and running up and fast for so many years that we finally said, you know what? Why don't we help take the next step and allow them to get started quickly and easily with some standard application types? And so what I'm going to do is hopefully at the end, if you would, in the question box as we're going, if you can think of any other types of starter templates that you would like to see that we don't have, because I'll talk about all of them that we have, but if you think of any starter templates that you'd like to see, please let us know. We Again, we're in the business of getting you up and running fast and getting your applications out the door as quickly as possible. Okay, so again, blank project screen, scariest thing. So what we've done is we've created some project templates that help you get started. These, these project templates are functional and they show also some of the better practices that we think you should use whenever you're building an application. They're fully functional and so when you load it up you're going to see some data in there. We're going to write some code for you to show you how we put the data in. Today's, the purpose of today's webinar is to show you how to take one of those samples and actually 
do some binding to a real database. And so I'm pretty excited about that. All right, let's talk about the different kinds. When you go into when you go into Visual Studio, you will see at the top, uh, you will see in the templates there's a Visual, uh, there's a Dev Express Visual C Sharp uh, section for Dev Express. I'll show you that in a second. But we have several different types of starter templates. You're going to notice that most of them are fairly similar, but there's a couple that are that are a little bit different for each uh, for each platform. So for example, for Silverlight, we have a Word and an Outlook-inspired application, and also a Silverlight application that, that sort of lets you lay out a project. And, and usually the layouts are pretty similar, and I'll, and I'll show you one in WinForms here. Uh, for Web, we have a little bit more, only because in MVC, we, we have MVC and we have standard ASP.NET. So we have a Web application, we have a Tablet application, we have an Outlook-inspired application, kind of like we saw before. We have the same for MVC an Outlook inspired web application. When we're looking at WinForms, again, we see Word, Outlook, and then we have a data analysis application uh, going there, and also of the WinForms standard application. And finally, for uh, WPF, we have the same Outlook and Word. And so what you're seeing is we have this sort of way that we've aggregated things, the standard kind of templates, and then the Word uh, kind of applications, Outlook type applications, and then we have the etc. Uh, so let's take a look at some of them. Let me open Visual Studio uh, here real quick. Man, I didn't open Visual Studio uh, uh, first, but the new Visual Studio 2012, as you see, is a little bit faster than the older version. So if you can upgrade, it's pretty cool. Uh, so one of the things that I, I also want to make sure to emphasize is if you can think of any templates that you would like to see that are not included, uh, let me know. And we will be happy to to start looking at including them. So that's, I think, a, a good thing if you can. Uh, I'd like to see. Maybe we, we can you can start typing them in, and we'll we'll sort of look at them at the end. Okay. So again, here is uh, you can see right here. We have the Visual C Sharp templates. Uh, you can also do a Visual Basic. We have them all in there as well. I, I happen to be a proponent of C Sharp, but again, VB same thing. Uh, so you can see right here we have all of the, the standard templates that we were talking about before. We have the Silverlight application, we have the web application, uh, web applications, the WinForms, the WPF, and the next AF is something that, that we'll leave for a later date, but we also have uh, templates for that. So let me zoom out and let me start with a web template. So the first one I'm going to show you is sort of a non-traditional one. It's this tablet web application. Uh, there's a, been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sort of momentum behind building things for sort of different form factors like your phone or your tablet. So what we did is we decided, hey, let's make a tablet web application. So I'm just going to click on it. Uh, it's going to go through a wizard to help you get started to do these things. In the wizard, we're going to ask you, hey, do you want these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just going to hit next. Also for a tablet application, we have a couple of of things that are important. For example, max allowed content length and bytes. Uh, this is very important, for example, when you're downloading stuff on a tablet and you're conscious about uh, how much data you can bring down. I'll hit the, the next button. And enable, we're going to hit enable HTML compression just because we can. And then we'll, hit, we'll do the default uh, and create project. OK. So uh, right away, what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and all the magic gerbils from Dev Express are going to go ahead and start to make a starter application for the t uh, a tablet. Now, it's going to take a little bit. And the reason why is because, again, we are actually building a fully sort of functional by way of, I don't mean functional in the terms that you can go to a database and get data back, but functional in terms of UI. The UI is going to be completely done for you. We're going to do the master pages. We're going to do scripts. We're going to put the images in there that we think should be in there. Let me let me go ahead and start this up with Internet Explorer. We're going to build something that is actually useful and that will actually do something for you. So we'll uh, we'll uh, let it get started here. Waiting for localhost. There you go. So notice in not very much time, I have an application. I have an application that literally looks like a good tablet application. And now I have a touch device, 
And so notice, you see, you don't see a mouse there. I actually have a, my finger is clicking things. Hopefully you can see the little, this is on Windows 8, of course. You can see that we have uh, touch enabled already. And so it's ready to go for, uh, for touch applications. You see, I mean, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool what we were able to do fairly quickly. I'm going to touch page two here. Notice that it loads it up. Everything is very fast and fluid to borrow from Microsoft's terminology. Now let's go to the default page and let's take a look at what we've done. You can see that not only did we do these templates, did we make these templates for you, but we've also added some comments that show you how to do some stuff. So for example here, we're saying, hey look, this is where you, where you work on the nav bar and we've tried to make it as intuitive as possible. And so when you look at the markup, you're getting a good feeling for how these things are set up. Okay, so that was just the, the quick template application. It's probably one of my favorite because it shows sort of the diversity of things we can do coupled with the functionality that we try to give you directly out of the box. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new one. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, do a WinForms one because this WinForms application is similar to what we do with the Silverlight application, similar to what we do with the WPF application, in that we're going to guide you through to make a... Uh, a WinForms application. So the first thing that comes up is this dialog box. In it, we say, hey, do you want to use a ribbon form or do you want to use an extra form or do you want to use a regular form? If you use a regular form, then you probably want toolbars and menus. In the navigation area, do you want to use a tree list? Do you want to use a, a none, a navigation bar? What do you want to put in the client area? Well, I want to put a, let's say I want to put a grid or a chart or a rich edit. Let's just leave it at grid. And let's change it to a, a ribbon form, and then the ribbon's all there. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit Create. Notice that this particular project template is the most flexible in that it's going to create sort of this structure for you to start filling in the gaps. In other words, the blank page syndrome is no longer going to affect you. Uh, so I'll go ahead and let it uh, finish up. Now you're going to see off to the right, you're going to see in the Solution Explorer, let me wait till it's done. Very good. In the Solution Explorer, you'll see we add all the references that are required. We also add some data so that you can see how things are going to be built. So here's, here's some data. So I'm going to do Control E D to move this around. We create a person and we show you what, what that person looks like. And then in the form itself, let me go to View Code. You can start to see how we set this up. Uh, so in a grid, we have a, a new grid and we just add new people which is a binding list. And uh, uh, it's really simple. Notice that it, this, this piece of code right here is probably the, the most simple to understand. In a grid list, we're adding a new binding list of person and we add new people. And in the grid control, we just say, hey, this is your new data source. That's it. Let me hit F5 to run it. Uh, and then when the application starts up, you're going to see an app that looks like, well, an application. Not only that, but we, we've added some things like, for example, some, some theming. Say you want it to look blue. Uh, this is already built in. You want their express style. It's this. I am particularly fond of these seven classic. It's the cleanest one as far as I'm concerned. These buttons obviously don't do anything because that's left, left up to you, but notice that we can change this to, to another name if we want. Uh, this happens to be my lovely wife's name. So you can, you can change stuff and you can see how this is working. We also have buttons here that, uh, that help you really get started. And so in essence, when you go to the Form 1 design, you can start to click on buttons and you can start to do whatever you want. So extra message box, message box dot show. Oh, hold on. I'll get control dot and then uh, show new uh, thingy. And so now when we run it, Pretend that this is like some out of this world excellent functionality that's just so beautiful you, you just die for. You click on it, notice that the new thingy pops up. It's pretty self-explanatory what's going on. Oh, let's, uh, let's, let's enable the exit button because we haven't done that. So I'm just going to say application.exit and I'll put hit F5. Notice that we've named the things intuitive things. We've named the, the elements in, uh, intuitive names so that you can actually use them. Oh, where's the application here? There we go. And so there it is. I hit exit and then there it is. 
Okay, so uh, that is just a sort of a a little bit of a, a sampler of some of the templates. We have other templates for WPF uh, that do the similar similar thing. And so I wanted to take a minute to show you what those look like. Okay, now let's move on to the meaty stuff. Uh, we're going to do scheduling in a snap, which means I am going to use the Outlook inspired uh, template to build an application that's bound directly to the database. We have the UI, we just need the data. So I'll hit escape here. I'll load up a SQL Server to show you what I've got going here. All right, I'll connect right here. This is SQL Server 2012 Developer Edition. I have a database called the Task Database, and I'll just show you the diagram so you can see what it is. It is a person table mapped to tasks. And I've, I've already gone ahead and filled out the, the, the person table a little bit. So let me go to persons and let me go to select the top 1,000 rows. And you're going to see that there's some people in there, nine of them. And these are the, the famous, these are the famous Northwind people that we always see in all of our databases. So then we have the task data, the task table, nothing in there. Our job is to create a tool that allows us to manage tasks for a person on a schedule. All right, so let's do it. By the way, Amanda, any questions that I've missed so far that it, this is a good place to start taking some questions. Any questions about the templates in general? Uh, no, no questions so far, Seth. Wonderful. So let me hit escape and let me go back to this. I must be doing a really good job then, Amanda. What do you think? I think you always do a great job. <laughs> She's playing solitaire, everybody. Okay. Let's, like, I mean, I can only have my mom log in so many times, you know, for a confidence boost. But when Amanda is playing solitaire during, during webinars, that's when, you know, it starts to get tough. All right. Let's go to File, New, Project. We're going to go to WinForms. We're going to use the Outlook inspired application. I'm going to call it the Task Manager because I think that makes sense. I'll hit OK. There you go. It's loading up the template. The code should be ready soon. All right. There it is. There's the application in all of its glory. Uh, let me go to Solution Explorer to show you what we've done. We've added all these nice things <clears throat> and then we have this main form that I am going to rename to main. Yes. All right, there we go. Happy. Let's run it. And the application starts off like this. We have a fully functioning, well not fully functioning, we have a fully functioning UI level sort of tool to, to uh, to do stuff. So notice that this task is there. Uh, I added it. You can click on it. You can look at it. You can change it to resource, whatever. Uh, you can change the skins. Remember, I like this seven skin. You have help that they don't do anything. And then we have appointment, uh, context sensitive stuff for appointments, which for us will be tasks. So I'm going to go ahead and click. Uh, these these don't do anything as you, as you might have expected, but these do. These are all sort of intertwined with the uh, the actual project. Okay, let's look at the code F7. Notice that we have uh, the, the schedule control start date, date time now, and then we have an init skin gallery. To be honest, this is probably the last we're going to see of any code. There's really no code to actually make this work for the database. So again, the task that we have is we want to map this pro uh, program, this project, to this data. So let's, let's do that. Okay, I'm going to put this down so you can see it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and have, we're going to go ahead and map the data. Now, the way to do this is pretty slick. I'm going to go ahead and go to add, and I'm going to say new item. And the new item we're going to add is something fairly new. It's the dexperience 12.1 ORM data model wizard. Now, if you are in 2010, this will work automatically. If you are in Visual Studio 2012, it did not work at first, 
but we've made a hot fix that will actually you can you can actually use this now. I'll make sure to get you a link so you can use this because this is pretty spiffy. I'm going to go ahead and, and change the name of this to tasks, and I'm just going to hit add. And the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to say, "Hey, set, tell me what uh, database you want." So it's opening a file. Give it a second. I'm going to hit map to an existing database. Let me move this move this over to the back. I'm going to hit map to an existing database and hit next. I'm going to use the Windows authentication and I'm going to connect to the local database. So now that we're connecting to the local database, I am going to use Windows authentication. I'm going to scroll down and hit the task database. I'm not going to use any stored procedures. So I'll hit next. Then I'll hit I'll get rid of sys diagram. This is just for diagram definitions that I showed you. I'm going to choose the person and the task table. Hit next. Done. So now we're done. Now let me show you what it's done. It's automatically created this view of your data. This is your task table. This is your person table. Not only that, but a person has, you can have zero or many people uh, to task. So it's a one-to-many relationship. Right, so a person can have many tasks or zero, zero many tasks. This right here is telling you that, hey, the PK, which is a uh, primary key uh, index, is going to be ignored because task ID happens to be a key and we don't have to do any work with that. Same with the PK, uh, person uh, index. So we'll just take that out. We have those fields. Okay, now the second part of, of, any, of any, uh, any application is you have to access the data but sometimes you have to shape the data as well. So we're going to go ahead and do some data shaping. For example, when we're looking at the person image, as you might have guessed, the person image is going to be a, a series of bits. So let me, there you go. So the DB type is of column type byte array, but you know a byte array is not the most useful of things, and it happens to be a real image. So we're going to use something called a value converter right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the drop down box and specify an image value converter which says, hey computer, when you look at this particular field, treat it as if it's an image. You can actually make your own custom value converter classes to convert any type of data over to any type of shape. So we're going to use the, the uh, image value converter here so that it treats it as a, a picture. So you'll see that now when we're with image we have this image value converter. The next thing is, you know what, I, I, we, we store this as first name and last name, but in reality, we just want to have a full name. So I'm going to right click and create something called a persistent alias. Now let me freeze this for a second and show you all the types of things you can do. Now we won't get into that this time because it's not, it's not the purpose of this particular webinar. But just remember that there's tons of things you can do. You can add composite fields, external persistent type fields fields, index, indices, and other things. So I'm going to go ahead and add a, a persistent alias. So we're going to hit persistent alias. We're going to call it name. And notice over here off to the right we have this expression. What do we want it to be? Well, this is going to be the first name and the last name. So I'm going to go here, click first name, click last name, and uh, via true uh, coding style we're going to say plus and put a space in between them, I'll hit OK. We are ready to go. So now, this, now notice now the, what we've done is we've created a connection point to our database and we've created the methodology to actually shape the data. Okay, so now we are done with the data access part. Now what we need to do is we need to think about how is the form going to access the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the um, the actual uh, uh, form itself. Let me make it a little bit smaller because it's a little big here. I'll just go like, there you go. Now what we're going to do is we have to have a way of accessing the objects because one of the things that I, that I didn't mention is if I were to build this, uh, the build would work, but notice that right here we have some extra stuff that was built for us. The first uh, happens to be this person uh, uh, person object. Notice a partial class, which means you can do some, some other things here. 
but in the in the designer itself, notice that we have the actual data that uh, that we actually are mapping to. The other thing that's important is we have this thing called a connection helper. This connection helper allows us to connect to the database. And so what I'll do right now is I'll just go ahead and go to the program. And let's remember the uh, let's remember the connection helper dot connect is what we want to use. So I'm going to go over here and say connection helper dot connect. And we're just going to use the auto uh, create option to none. Notice that in XPO you could define your data up front and then magically persist that to a database. And we take care of all the SQL queries and all the DDLs that you need and the, and the DMLs, uh, uh, DDL, DDL scripts that you need. So since it already exists, I'm going to hit none. And I'm just going to say, which means that we are just going to read data and we're going to post data back. We're not going to worry about the schema. The next thing we have to do is we have to worry about our default session, which is an XBO thing, which means, look, whenever by default we're going to do anything with XBO, if we don't have a, an explicit connection, well, let's just go ahead and use this default session. And that uh, default session is going to be just a new session. So what this says is it says if there's ever a time where you don't define a session, just use the default one, which happens to be a new. Okay, so that's the those are the two lines of code that we have to put in there just to say to the program, hey, use this database, and the default session is going to be this XPO default dot session new session. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the main form. Let's go close all but this so that we don't have to clutter our view. And now let's get into the business of actually making uh, making the connection. So I'm going to go down to uh, uh, DX 12.1 data, and I am going to drop two XP collections. Right? If you're not familiar with XP XPO, XPO stands for Express Persistent Objects. It's an ORM tool, an object relational modeling tool that DevExpress has and that we use extensively similar to entity framework if you want to look at it that way uh, and so if you for example you're using any framework you use entity collections to, to actually materialize these things I'm using XP collections myself all right so let's go to the properties here and let's create one for XP tasks and let's do one for uh, XP persons now the thing about this is you, you have to be careful because if you don't build this beforehand we will not have the metadata that we need for the object class info. The object class info tells the system which class to use for this particular collection. So let me go ahead and click there. Uh, notice that there is a task and a person. This one happens to be person, so I'll just put persons in there. And so now when you look at it, you'll see that it's mapped to persons. We'll zoom out here and we'll go back to tasks. And we'll go to properties, and the class info here for this one will be uh, tasks. Very good. So now what we've done is we've completed the circle. Now we have some UI elements that actually will take care of the back and forth between the, uh, the database. Now, the important thing is on task, we need to do one extra thing. And the reason why is because uh, we, we are very conscious of, of your data, and we want to preserve it. So the default behavior on a deletion of a particular element is to not persist the delete over. But you can change that by going to properties and changing this delete object on remove. I'll hit true. And the reason why is because, again, we're very conscious of your data. In, in essence, what you can do is you can actually do a list change event. Whenever the list changes, you can, you can do whatever persistence mechanism you want. But for us, you know, we're going to delete tasks. We're not going to leave persons, and so we'll we'll just go ahead and leave it, leave it like that. So now, when we delete a task from the uh, the scheduler, we're going to delete it also from the tasks. All right. So now, next step. Now we need to have the uh, the scheduler control understand that these are the things that it's going to be working with. And now, when you when you zoom into the scheduler storage, which happens to be the persistence mechanism for the scheduler, we have three things that you're going to look at. The first happens to do with appointments. In our, in our case, these are the tasks. The second has to do with the resources for the appointment. That is, who's going to carry out the tasks? That's going to be the people. 
And then we have this thing called appointment dependency. Now, we're not going to worry about that too much now, but if you go in, uh, to search.devexpress.com and do appointment dependencies, you'll see that an appointment dependency is more for a Gantt type chart where you have a appointment or a task that depends on a task to be completed previously. And so you can, you can talk about that. We won't worry about that this time because we just don't need it. But again, you can, you can set that up as well. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open the smart tag and set the resources to, you guessed it, XP person. The next thing that's going to happen is say, hey, Seth, I need to know which maps to what. So we're going to go ahead and change those things. The first thing we're going to change is the caption. Remember the caption is this calculated field that we have. We want the first name and the last name. The second thing that we're going to change is the ID. The ID happens to be person ID. And this time we have an image, remember? The image is the image. And we have the image value converter that will go ahead and change it into an image, that, an image format that the control can understand. And for a parent ID, we don't have that, so I'll just select none. Okay. We'll hit next, and we'll hit finish. There's nothing really here for custom properties that we have to do, so I'll hit finish. The next is the appointment data. I'm going to go ahead and select the tasks. Now we have a couple of changes that we need to do. The appointment ID, as you might have guessed, is the actual task ID. The uh, the percent complete, we don't have anything for that, so we'll, we'll just go ahead and set it to none. And the resource ID is happens to be the person ID, but the key. Right? So we've set this up. Everything else stays about the same. I made it so that it would map more or less to the, to the actual um, control itself. Uh, so I'll hit next. We don't really need anything here. I'll hit finish. Okay. So believe it or not, we are mostly done. Mostly done. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of sort of uh, aesthetic things to make the scheduler control look a certain way. Okay, so we're going to go down to the view area. Yeah. Oh, we're on events. That's why. That was weird. So we'll scroll down to the view. And we're going to change the active view type to week. We want to see a week at a time. We want to group things by resource. Oh, I want to do work week, not, not full week. Let me do work week because that's a little bit better. There you go. That, that looks a little better. We want to group, group type by resource, which means we want a, uh, a five-day period for each resource. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change uh, the way it works. So we're going to go to work week view and do a couple of things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to set the uh, resources per page. Let me scroll down here. QR, there it is, to two. Because at zero, what it will do is it will show all the people, which is nine, and it'll look ugly. Trust me. So we're just going to change that. And then we're going to go to show work time only and set that to true so that we're only showing 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. All right. That is it. We are done. Okay, let me hit F5. There it is. There's Nancy and Andrew Fuller and, you know, Janet and Margaret and all these good people. They're ready to go. So now for the moment of truth, though, we want to add a task for uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy is going to, for example, build, build a chair. She happens to be a woodworker and she likes building chairs. Notice when I click on it, automatically... Notice what we have here, and this is the cool part. Automatically, the resource has all the peeps, all the people that we had before. Right? We can also add a description. Uh, use uh, cedar uh, because it smells nice. Very good. And notice it's already set there. Showtime is busy. We can show time is whatever, but we'll hit OK. There you go. Now, moment of truth. Let's go to the database. Let's open it up. And let's execute. Notice that we have here the task already in the database. Now let me show you something cool. Let me go to the build a chair and let's say that, uh, that Nancy doesn't like building chairs as much as say, I don't know, Janet. 
So I'll move it over to Janet. There you go. I put it there. Notice what happened. You see that? The person ID changed to three. Notice that we already have this intelligence built in, ready to go, and the only code we wrote, remember, was two lines of code to connect to the database. All right, let's delete this because uh, we're gonna, we don't wanna do that anymore, so I hit delete. Let me go over here. It's gone. All right, so let's, let's be crazy and let's start adding some tasks for everybody. There you go, one for you, one for you. Okay, let's go, uh, Andrew Fuller is there. Let's, let's go over a little bit. Uh, uh, to uh, to a Nancy, so Nancy's going to do some stuff there. So we got that. Nancy's first, so we'll go next. Uh, let's not forget Margaret Peacock because she has a lot of work to do, and so does Stephen Buchanan. And oops, I went over too much. So there we go. This guy, this guy, very good. Oh, that's the last one. So there's no more. Okay, so we've created all of these uh, all of these uh, uh, tasks. Oh, there's a couple more. Forgot about her and forgot about her. Oh, look, that's an all-day one. I, it's a two-day one, so you'll see that that's in there. Notice uh, that, oh, oh, no, why is it not showing up? Hold on, maybe I didn't save them. Uh-oh. Did I not save them? We had execute. Oh, I don't know why that's not working. Let me try one more time. So let me do a Control-A and let me delete them. Let's see what happens when we delete them. Let me add this one again. Very good. So let's see one more time. Oh, no, I'm not sure why that's not working. It worked before, but it, for some reason it doesn't seem to be working. But the, the idea, again, is that this should happen automatically. So let me, let me start again, because that's, that's weird that it's not doing that. So let me, let me start the project again. And if it doesn't do it, I'll find out the reason, and I'll tell you. It's probably something that I missed. Uh, very good. So notice it remembered Andrew Fuller's. Let me create a new one. Hello, world. Let me hit enter. Let me change some description here. Hit OK. It's 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 mapped to Nancy. There should be two there. There it is. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe I went too fast or something. I don't know. Let me let me let me be. Let me go a little bit slower and say, Janet likes uh, to fix cars. So we'll, uh, we'll do that there. Let's make sure it puts it in. Weird. I don't know why it's not doing it. But I'll, I'll figure it out. Uh, generally, maybe, maybe you have to actually open it up and change something, but I'm not sure. Uh, but I'll definitely find out what, what it is that's going on. There you go. See, I, I think you have to actually edit it. It's not persisting it. Uh, and so maybe that's, that's the case. But, you know, there might be a setting on XP Collection that says, hey, hold it until it closes or whatever. But there's probably some setting that I'm missing. So let me, let me do one more. Okay, and there you go, there should be four. Yeah, so there it, it is working. I, I don't know what happened, there was probably a little glitch there. I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the slides and let me give you some, uh, some notes here. The first is the XP, the XPO designer for BS 2012 hotfix. Let me open that up here so you can see what that is. This is a, somebody said, hey, it didn't work. And for some reason, I don't know why it didn't work. We're like, hey, we'll fix it. So you can download this intermediate build. Otherwise, you can wait for our, uh, uh, for our intermediate release. That's going to happen here sometime soon. The next is for XPO Designer. If you want to know a little bit more about that, you go to help.devexpress.com and you can uh, load up uh, the uh, help system. Or if you want to look at the, uh, if you want to look at how to do stuff with our scheduler. You can go to our scheduler stuff and we tell you all sorts of stuff in here about how to get started, creating a simple uh, scheduling application. Again, we've gone through all of this. Actually, our the cool thing is, notice that we uh, our template does this, our template does this, our template does this, and we just spent a little time doing this, right? So that's what that was. Alrighty. The database, if you want the task database to reproduce this particular thing, I'm happy to send it to you. Email it to me. Email or request to me, and I'll, I'll send it off, or I'll put it somewhere where everyone can get it. Okay, so I think I've gone the estimated 40-ish uh, minutes. Uh, let me back up here, and let's go to questions. Amanda. Seth. Did you win at Solitaire? <laughs> I'm just checking. 
I'm playing poker up here. Oh, my office. goodness gracious. And yes, I'm winning. Oh, All right, we do have a ton of questions that were coming in there at this uh, last bit. Uh, first off, um, the application and or the application components does it need some redistribute redistributables when publishing? Uh, yes. Uh, let me. A good question. That is an excellent, excellent, excellent question. So let me go over to the to the actual uh, project itself. Let me close it and let me show you. We have what is called royalty-free distribution. And all you need to do, say, say you want to do the simplest deployment method ever for our tools. Notice that we added a series of references. I'm going to highlight them, go to properties, and I'm going to say copy local set to true. Okay, very good. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to go to the, uh, to the build menu. And I'm going to say batch build, and I'm going to say build. All right, ready to go. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the actual folder where this is living, and I'm going to go to bin release. Hold on, let me. I can escape this for a little bit. Let me close this. Let me go down this. Lots of stuff. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to make a new task manager. I'm going to go Control A, copy it over here. <clears throat> We'll close this. Notice that here, I'm going to open this up. I am going to create a shortcut here. I'm going to rename this to Task Manager, and I'm just going to click on it. <clears throat> Wait for it. It's jitting as we speak, and now notice that this is the application. So in essence, I have actually created a distributable application right from Visual Studio that is bound to the database. Remember we put these things in there? It still remembers them. Let me let me do one more. So let's uh, let me click on it here. Let's put some uh, notice that it's going to add the thing we wanted to, right? Notice that this application now is a live application that I've deployed via what's called X copy deploy, or you can create a setup tool. So if you want to de deploy this, all you need to do is make sure you set copy local with true and start distributing away. The only thing that is not allowed by our end user license agreement is the deployment of our designer assemblies. And you can go to devexpress.com and go to the bottom and look at our EULA. You can click on the EULA link and you can see what our licensing is for that. Great question. All right, Amanda, next question. Um, is all this stuff localizable, meaning can I have it in another language? Absolutely. In fact, I, I'll just go back to this folder. Notice that we automatically have it localized for German, Spanish, Japanese, and Russian. Yes. If you want to do it to some other language, there is some great documentation. In fact, if you go to tv.devexpress.com, and look at uh, internationalization, I think is the search. Uh, you'll be able to find a webinar where I show you how to do internationalization of your application. But yes and yes. OK, next question. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, going through. That's great. Are we going to do karaoke time now? <laughs> Let's do it. Nobody wants to hear that. Right. Uh, from Tony, so you're showing, at some point, you were showing a day view for everyone. How hard is it to switch to a timeline view while keeping the people's images at the top? Oh, I don't know. I've never tried that. Let's find out together. There's a song for this. We're all in this together. Yes. I did watch that movie. All right. Let's go to, <laughs> what? what? Let's go to day view. My sense is that you'll be able to control everything you want to control here in this day view area. Notice we have the resources per page. Let's try it. I'm feeling adventurous. Let's go to day view. Let's go to resources per page two. Uh, what was the other thing? Uh, I don't know. Show more buttons. True. Show more. Yeah, you can row hide, et cetera. We'll just hit run right now and see what happens. 
I'm sitting on the edge of my seat wondering what this will look like. Yeah, looks like it's exactly the same except for days. Hey, I did it. First try. There you go. Yes and yes. Next question, Amanda. Uh, does XPO now support more MySQL column types? In the past, it didn't support some common types. Well, let's take a gander here. Uh, let's do a help.devexpress. Com. Why are you using MySQL, man? You should use PostgreSQL. It's the new hotness. That's what I've been told, at least. Let me go to Express Persistent Object. Let's go to Feature Center. And where is this? Fundamental. Okay. Data type supported by XPO. Looking for MySQL, that would be right over here. These are the fields that we support. Yeah, it looks like a good, a good amount. Is this enough for you? We have bit, tiny int, unsigned, tiny int, car, double, 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 real, small int, small int, unsigned, int, unsigned, int, big int, big int, car, 38, which is a GUID, write an enum, underlying type, bar, car, date, time, double, and long blob for pictures and long text. Yes, that's what we've got. Uh, hopefully that's enough. If it's not, uh, shoot us a line, uh, shoot us an email and we'll see what we can do to help. All right, next question. From Kimberly, can you use Oracle as the back-end database? If so, can you touch on how to do that? Absolutely. In fact, you remember when I right-clicked on this and I hit Add New Item and I did the ORM thing, ORM thing, we're going to map to an existing database. Notice that you can change this. Do I not see Oracle in there? There, there is a way. Oh, it is in there. What am I doing? Let me let me hit. There's like a scroll bar that I'm like, and I'm getting confused because I don't know how to use a scroll bar. Right? There's Oracle. When you click Oracle, then you start to get into the server name, uh, username and password stuff, and then once we get past this step, everything is exactly the same. Great question. All right. Hey, so question. so Tony uh, popped back in and said uh, when you did the timeline view versus day view with the pictures. Mm hmm. He says, he just says timeline view, not day view. I... Oh, okay, let's take a look at that. Let me go over, let me delete this guy. I, I misunderstood. I thought day view, what, what, who was I paying attention to that time, dang it? Nobody. Right, me, I know, right? Let's go down and let's change the, oh, I know, timeline view is like the, the Gantt type view, if I remember right, so we'll go to, We'll go to, uh, oh, no, timeline. I've never seen it. Let's go and let's hit next and let's see what happens. So we switched to the timeline. Oh, look at their pictures. They're not very good. But, okay, uh, you, and, and he's saying he wants these at the top. Is that what he's saying? Yeah, that's what his original question was. Unfortunately, the way that this is designed is timeline view is a linear as it progresses through time in the positive x direction. So if we put it on the top, it wouldn't really be, we'd have to intersperse it. So I think this is just the way it's been laid out. One of the things that we can do is, let me go ahead and see if I can fix the, uh, the height of the actual row. So let me go to properties. Let me go down to, uh, uh, to view and let's go to views and let's go to timeline view. And there's got to be a cell height options and we're going to set the min height type to like I don't know 200 and let me hit run as far as putting it at the top I'm, I'm not sure that that would be conducive to the timeline oh I don't know why that didn't work oh it's I know why because remember how many resources do we show per page so let's go to let's go to the view down here let's go to uh, the views and let's go to the timeline view, and let's go to uh, resources per page. We're going to pick two, and now we're going to hit run. All right. <clears throat> there you go. That looks a little bit better. Right. And then we obviously there's some things we can do to fix here. But as far as putting it at the top, I want you to think about this. If we were to put this at the top, we would only be able to put one person in here. And so I think the design decision has been, since we're we're going on, excuse me, so we're going along on linear time, with positive x direction being in the future and, and negative being in the past, 
I think the design decision was made that this would be this way. So uh, hope, hopefully that helps. He says, Tony says, got it, makes sense how it's stacked so on the side is cool. Wonderful. So I've made a new friend. That's excellent. Now I have two friends if you include my mom. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, do you have templates for reports? No, but I can make some. What do you mean by, <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Oh, man, I totally, sp we do. In, in fact, it, let me do this. Great question. So let me go new item, and let's add a report. Let's go up to the report class, and let's add a uh, my report. There is an excellent underused feature. And if you guys, maybe I, I should do a blog post about this later on if you want to help out. But we have, did I? Okay, yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll move these guys over here. We don't want this. Blah, 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 blah. Let me go here. Notice this thing. Load report template. Watch this. Boom. I hit this. Notice, we have, they're, maybe they're not very pretty because again, I'm not a, my wife is a smart one when it comes to making things look good. I'm not very good. Uh, but notice that we have some templates that you can draw from. If you'd like me or us or our designers to make even different templates, let us know. And so when you open this up, we're going to hit load. Notice that automatically it's like an employee's thing, right? But it may be not bound correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a data source. Let me go to the toolbox here. Hold on, I got too many things going on here. Let me let me add a XP collection to this form. This is going to be the, obviously the XP person. Let me close this. Close that. Close that. Let me close that. Let's go to XP. Uh, let's change it to. Uh, dang it! I got to rebuild. Hold on. So I've rebuilt. Ready. Let's go to the XP collection here. Let's take the uh, let's take the object class info. Let's do the person. Now we have this thing called the edit bindings, which allows us to change the bindings. So we'll do first name here, first name, then last name, then title. Let's see. Do they have an extension? They don't. So I'll just fake it and put like a higher date or something. And then we'll put a state right there. OK. So I hit OK. Notice that everything has been rebound. There is your report templates. These are online templates. They live on our servers. We are happy to add any kinds of templates that you would like. OK. Uh, next question. Um, we don't, it's not a question, but Tony says, we use the DevX reporting extensively, and it's a terrific tool getting better with every release. Oh yeah, see that's one of the pro uh, that's one of the products that I get to PM. I am the I am the product manager over certain products. One of them is reporting, and I am very happy that you think so, because we work very hard to make it easy. And we are oh, and if you like what you have now, just wait until twelve two. We are seriously, your socks are gonna just fly right off your feet when you see what we're doing. You're gonna be so excited about this. I am excited about it, but unfortunately, I can't talk about it right now. Other than. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. You're such a tease, Seth. Such I know, right? So that's uh, that's coming up soon. We might start talking about it here shortly. Yeah, maybe. So, so there you awesome. go. Awesome. That's all the questions, Seth. And we are about to our hour mark. Wow. Let me go ahead and put up the last slide. Uh, just in case you have any questions, again, you can reach me at setchadevexpress.com or at Seth Juarez on Twitter. Uh, or if you go to devexpress.com front slash Seth, you'll be able to see whatever it is that I write or blog post. If you would like, again, please, 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 I, I said this twice, but I can't say it enough. If there are project templates or report templates that you feel we need to create on your behalf, we would be more than happy to do so. Just let us know, and we'll put it into our pipeline of development. Okay, thanks again. And Amanda, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Seth. Um, all right, everybody, so visit devexpress.com for our upcoming webinar sessions, plus register to watch our DXtreme announcement on September 17th. You don't want to miss this one. DXtreme tools deliver an innovative solution for developers who want to create multi-screen applications across platforms and devices. We're excited to provide you with a sneak peek 
into the future of the next generation of tools by DevExpress and the latest release in our DX2 family of products. You can register right now on our homepage for this exciting on-demand event. Today. Can I do a sound effect? Yeah. <laughs> That's the sound effect. I should have done that while you were saying it. Oh, go ahead. Say it again. Well, sorry. I don't know. I don't it's know late that. over here. I'm sorry. It's uh, late. Okay. Um, hold on. We did have a question pop up, and I know you love to answer questions. So while you're still here, from Harold, what about our discussion regarding storage control dot appointment array? Oh, yes, Harold. Welcome. I, I was chatting with him earlier. Okay. Let me talk about this very briefly because it will be really easy. So when you, for those of you that are, are new to uh, programming or you're looking at stuff, notice that when I go to scheduler storage and I bind appointments to XP tasks, what I'm binding to is the promise of a collection of task objects to be in existence for the scheduler control. What happens is when, oh, and I'll, I'll let me, let me set a breakpoint here so you can, uh, well, actually, let me let me put let me put let me do an, an uh, let me do an event here uh, on this. Um, are you are you showing stuff on your screen? Oh, I hit pause. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm on pause now. Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna do a list change. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna hit the breakpoint here. I'm gonna load this up, <clears throat> and we should hit this breakpoint. There you go. Notice. What happened is the XP task object actually, let me go to a quick watch. <clears throat> now has stuff, right? Before it did not have stuff. Now it has stuff. And so when you look at the scheduler, so so let, let me go to a, a scheduler storage. I, let, me, let me see what the name of the object is, I forgot. So scheduler storage, that's right. So if I let me let me go ahead to uh, quick watch here, and if I go to scheduler storage, there's an object there. Notice that the appointments uh, uh, has a collection of things, right? So if I go to non-public members, let's see, or maybe the base. Here's the data manager. It says this is get this is going to get the items, and this is the actual items. Notice that right now there is nothing in it. What happens is, as the as, as the list continues to change, and the control uh, binds to the data, then there's going to be stuff in there. So I should probably set a breakpoint. Dang it! I need to set a breakpoint on on a button here. Let me let me set a breakpoint on a button. So let me go to uh, main design. Let me go to uh, let me go to inbox, and let's just do something there. When I click on that. I should be able to just click on that. So, well, let, let me cheat because I don't know why it's not doing what I wanted to do. But let me go to common controls and let's just put a let's put a button up here and let me click on it. Okay, so I'll set a breakpoint here and I'll set a breakpoint here. So I'll hit F5. <clears throat> now notice that it's it's not loaded. Let me hit F5 again. Notice that it is loaded now. So let me go to uh, let me go again to XP tasks because notice that before it changes something's happening. So XP tasks should have a list of items, <clears throat> base, results view. There's the items. There's one, two, three, four, five, six tasks, uh, five tasks. Now let me go to the uh, a scheduler storage. And let's head on over to the appointments. And let's go to the actual base object and then items, results. Notice that now it is there. So here's the thing. Notice before XP task got filled, there was nothing in the appointments. After XP task got filled, then there was stuff in the appointments. So the appointments is really just a mapping to a collection of items that are stored in an array, uh, an array of sorts inside of XP task. But it's probably more of a collection. It's an I enumerable. Uh, let me move this over. I enumerable, which happens to be a list of things. There's a non-public members. It has the ID hash. It has the storage. It has everything in there. And so what you can do is uh, to answer Harold's question is notice that there is a difference between when there's data in the actual uh, XP tasks list 
and then after the data is loaded, then the mappings exist. So one of the challenges Harold's was having is when he was accessing appointments, he's probably accessing it before it was filled. And so that's uh, that should should be helpful. Okay, great question. All right, Amanda. All right, thank you, Seth, for getting back in there. No problem. <laughs> All right, everybody. So we do have one more. I have one more webinar plug. Uh, we're doing a developer tools build versus buy presented by our Forrester principal analyst Jeffrey Hammond. It's coming up on September 25th. Is it more cost effective to build tools and components on your own or to purchase them? Dev Express commissioned a study by Forrester Research to investigate this question and to track the return on investment an average company realized when implementing third-party tools. Uh, in this webinar, Jeffrey will walk you through an ROI calculation model and help you consider how you might evaluate your future tools investments. So that's for the 25% of you who don't use third-party tools on this webinar. Um, and of course, while you're on our site, you can download our universal trial at devexpress.com slash trial. Thanks again to Seth for an excellent presentation. Thanks to CoProject for hosting us. And of course, thank you all for joining us. Let's see what develops.